William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. One kind of free lodging that leaves everyone cold, folks, is when it's yours, by courtesy of the city mall. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. There's one little thing a confidential investigator has in common with a crooner or a tap dancer. Ballyhoo. You can't get enough of it. The right kind of publicity break with pictures and that, and your fees skyrocket. Even better than money, you promote your pick of jobs, scoop off the cream. I wangled me a break like that. A lady reporter, Mona Gale, assigned to follow me around by the True Life Picture magazine. An elegant redhead, lugging a camera and a notebook. She'd been ordered to profile me and get the story of my life from cradle to now. But the assignment had her missed, I could see. I wasn't important enough people for her. Is there some point to this dreary hike you've got me on, Mr. Craig? Yeah, there is. Tenement Row, near the dock. America's melting pot. Out of it comes governors, songwriters, bookies. Look around you. I have looked around me. Then start taking notes. Garfield Place. I was a kid on this block. That rat trap there. I played stickball off the stoop. Go ahead, sister, and make with a pencil. Must I? Posterity will want to know. Are you naturally egotistic, Mr. Craig? Are you naturally a snob? I'm tired. So have a seat here on the stoop. Ah. What's better than sitting? Grand view, huh? Mm, great. Dirty faced children, push cart, squalor. Isn't there some other way of profiling you, Mr. Craig? Like? Oh, one of those celebrated cases you perform in so heroically. Couldn't I just watch you at work? Sure. If I had a case, which right now I haven't. Come on, beautiful. Get the feel of this block. Imagine back to me as a kid. That kid over there, reading the comics. Now, he could be me once upon a time. How about that weird-looking boy carrying the parrot? Boy carrying a what? Parrot. Well, yes. What do you know? The kid is carrying a parrot. And coming this way, too. He wants to pose for a before and after picture with you. Hey, want to buy a parrot, mister, for cheap, mister? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, Sonny. He yours? No, I found him on a dock. Lost. He's sick. Sick? Yeah, yeah. Look at the blood on his foot. Yeah, it is blood. Bring him closer. Hey, what you examine him for? Like a doctor. Funny. The parrot hasn't been hurt. Not a scratch on him, I can see. But the blood... I'll bet ten. It's human blood. Human blood, Mr. Craig? Yeah. Now, figure that. Oh, if only the parrot could talk. Hey, he talks good. Watch. Hey, go ahead, you talk. Oh, don't shoot me. <laughs> don't shoot me. Is that the parrot talking, or is the boy a ventriloquist? Help! 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 The parrot, all right, yelling bloody murder. Sit tight, sister. You hold on to that parrot. Where are you going? The telephone check with Lieutenant Trav Rogers at police headquarters. I want to know what bloody corpse the parrot belongs to. Could be you will be watching me work after all. <laughs> Mona got to watch me work. Over the phone, Lieutenant Trav Rogers set up a date for the parrot to be reunited with his master. The setting for the sentimental reunion was the city morgue. Roll him out, Ernie. The parrot belonged to him, Craig. Oh, steady, Mona. Who was he, Trav? A Vince Lorimer, according to an identification card in his wallet. He was found on the docks beside an empty bird cage, shot to death by an unknown assailant. And? We traced him to a banana boat. He booked passage from Honduras to New York. Period? Period. On ship, Lorimer kept to himself, stayed in his cabin. Uh. A mystery figure, isn't that how a reporter would headline him, Miss Gale? That parrot you two chanced across was Larma's only known companion. Can I see the cage the parrot came in, Roger? If you must meddle. 
I'm being immortalized by True Life magazine, so please don't louse it up. This is the cage. How do you figure the parrot escaped, Fred? Larimer was shot. He dropped the cage. This padlock broke off in the fall. The cage door flew open, et cetera, et cetera. And the parrot dropped the walk, huh? No, Lieutenant, I don't think so. You don't? Not enough concussion for a padlock to snap off. Larimer could only be carrying the cage a couple of feet off the ground. So? Look at the twist and the wire here, where the padlock was originally secured. Hmm. The wire is unusually twisted. The padlock didn't break off. It was broken off, deliberately. But why would a killer stop to do that, Craig? I'm puzzled like you're puzzled. Any other personal belongings found on the late Vince Flowerman? Uh, just this wristwatch, pocket knife, the silver ring. The silver wedding ring. The end? The dead end. A corpse, a parent, a few meaningless trinkets. Where would you go from here, Mr. Holmes? Oh, you're sure working hard at lasting me up with Mona. But it so happened, a detour developed in the dead end. The next morning, while I was sorting my mail over coffee and sinkers in the crosstown banner, and while waiting for the red-headed Mona to show up for her day's grind, the mail was the usual garbage. Bills, all of them stamped final notice. Circulars advising me where to get my pants spray, where to buy my geranium, and one circular I really stopped to read. Starbright Park Museum of Murder, exhibits in wax. The circular entitled Sarah to a 50% admission discount. Good morning, Mr. Craig. The ripened friendship we got, it's time you call me Barry. With a good morning kiss. If that's how you like to start your day. Mm. Look, I was assigned to you to play Boswell, Barry, not Madame Bovary. And what, pray, have you in store for me today? A trip to the Starbright Amusement Park. Amusement park. Read the circular. Bargain rate. So? Read where it says about the new wax exhibit. Oh, see, the brutal murder of Vince Lorimer. So real it will startle you. Hey, Vince Lorimer. Our corpse of yesterday. But, but, but how... How could, could a wax exhibit already be set up for the customers less than 24 hours after the murder happened? Yes, and circulars printed. Printed and in the mail. One of them in the mail to me. You think it was purposely? I'd be a dope not to think that. I'm not only being invited to get a look at Vince Larimer being shot, but also at who is shooting him. All this in wax. It's incredible. I'm in an incredible business, beautiful. In what other business can you get an educated redhead personally assigned to you? Starbright Park was a ramshackle amusement area, a stone's throw off a public highway. Well, here's your museum of murder. Those signs, shocking, sensational, lurid. And clothes. No ticket taker, no open door. It's boarded up? There's a bell here. This side door. What do you want? A word with the owner, lady. I'm the owner. Oh. I'm Barry Craig. This is Miss Gale. So what? I got a circular from you in this morning's mail. It's this one. You and a thousand other people, mister. Everybody from A to C in the telephone directory. Oh, and you didn't mean the circular especially for me? Are you out of your mind? Often. The circular advertises an exhibit of the murder of a man named Vince Lorimer. You come to prove to me you can read? And also to see the exhibit. Another time when we're open. You're closed? For safety repairs. The building department found 14 violations. Oh. Come again. Wait. I want in. You say that like a cop. Invite us in. <laughs> Having fun, Moore? It's gruesome. Snyder and Ruth Gray in the hot seat. Dillinger bleeding all over Chicago sidewalk. Why, baby, you're holding hands. I got affectionate and morbid surroundings. The Vince Larimer murders the last one in a row, right after Bluebeard. It is. Some light on the subject, please. I got no lights to switch on. The power battery's disconnected. 
Another order of the almighty building department. Here, you can use this flashlight. Thanks. Hey, quite a likeness. Barry, the victim does look like Vince Lorimer. Like Lorimer posed for it. Even the clothes, the pinstripe suit. And holding a cage with the parrot still in it. The minutes before the actual murder the scene's supposed to be. Uh, miss, or is it madam? It's Dolly. Dolly Flanders. Dolly, the hooded killer holding the gun. Why the hood? Well, I don't get your question. Is there a head, a face under the hood? Yes, I guess there is. Model, how? How? In the likeness of the killer, I mean. In the likeness? Well, how could that be? That's the question I'm saving for later. First, suppose you raise the hood. Get in there and raise it, Dolly. Don't raise it, Dolly. Dolly! Voices jump you all the time in my business, Mona. You take it calmly. Raise as you are, Dolly. Craig? Yeah? Drop that flashlight. Try beaming it at me and... Okay, stubborn. <laughs> Dolly, he shot you! No. Bullseye on the flashlight. My wrist dead from the concussion. Get flat on the ground, face down, Craig. And your lady friend. Be smart, Craig. From where I am, you're a clay pigeon. Get down, Mona. <laughs> Horizontal in a wax museum. Include that in the piece you're writing. I'll even include it on my headstone. You, Dolly. What? This box of matches. Pick it up. Now this newspaper. Now roll the newspaper into a torch and light it. You slick. What shall I do now? A wax figure holding the gun. Stick the torch under the hood and hold it there. <laughs> Let's see how fast it melts. But the figure melted down, my gun-happy friend took one last precaution. I hate working over a guy when he's down. But you will. So you'll stay put while I leave? <laughs> bomb burst in my head set off the chain reaction. The last thing I heard before being blown to bits was Mona screaming. <laughs> I came around. A long night and a hundred years later, I came around. There was a face looking down on me. Pretty with red hair. Red eyes. Red eyes from crying. Crying over me. Oh, Barry. And music. Bird music? The music, Mona. It's a yellow canary singing. You're in Dolly Flanders' office. Dolly Flanders? Dolly. I'm not responsible for what happened out there. Who was he? I don't know any more than you do, Doc, like it was. He didn't want me to see the face under the hood. Because it was his own face, Barry. He's the man who murdered Vince Larmer. Yeah, the obvious conclusion. Maybe even too obvious. Dolly. What? How come a wax exhibit here dramatizes a murder that happened only yesterday? You tell me. Don't you order your own exhibits? No, I take what's shipped to me on a rental basis. So much a season. Shipped to you by whom? A Mr. Scala. Fernando Scala, a wax sculptor. Where do I find Scala? He's got a studio in Havermeyer Flats near the railroad yard. Number 179. You're through third degree in me? No. How come you, a woman, run this kind of a business? Your husband, isn't he with you? How'd you know I had a husband? The silver wedding ring on your finger. Oh. Well, coming back to your first question about me and this business. Yes? I won't be in it anymore after today. Why not? I just sold it. As is, lock, stock, and barrel. Who to? Do I have to answer that, too? Not if it's a secret. It's no secret. Here's my copy of the bill of sale. Know ye by these presents that Howard Crump, purchaser, has this day for the sum of... Mr. Howard Crump thinks he's going to coin a mint run in this museum, as it should be run, so he says. Won't he coin a mint? He'll starve to death. That yellow canary of yours, you ever uh, let it out of its cage? Why should I do a fool thing like that? Skip it. Expecting visitors, Dolly? Crump. He haunts the place to see I don't cart nothing away now that he's bought the place. Come in, Crump. Dolly? Oh, excuse me. This is Mr. Craig. With him is Miss Gale. 
How do you do? Congratulations on your purchase, Mr. Crump. Oh, you know? Yeah, Dolly was telling us. Dolly said you're convinced there's a profit in murder. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> That's a curious way to put it. Then you put it. Uh, yes, I believe a wax museum can be run profitably. With, of course, judicious management and promotion. The underlying principle, Mr. Craig, in any business... Cut. My aching head, Crump. The head I'm taking out of here is already twice the size I came in with. Coming, Mona. Outside the wax museum in a drugstore, while Mona calmed her fevered nerves with a double coke, I got the cracks in my skull glued and an iodine pomade where it lumped. After that, I telephoned police headquarters. Hello, Lieutenant Trav Rogers? Never mind paging him, Buster. A message will do from Barry Craig. Tell him to check Prince Lorimer's fingerprints with police files. Pronto. Uh-uh. They're asking more questions than I've got answers. <laughs> like Dolly had said, the Havermeyer Flat studio of Fernando Scala, wax sculptor specializing in murder, overlooked the railroad yard. Right side guy, Scala, the mouth of a mustache and the look of a fox. With those trains, how can you concentrate on your wax modeling, Scala? Even better with the trains, Mr. Craig. I am filled with a wild rhythm. Spare me the poetry. Then, uh, for the lady. Spare her the poetry, too. All right. I say only what you want me to say. No wonder. Where do you keep your crystal ball? Crystal ball? You identified the man who murdered Vince Larimer. I identified a murderer? <laughs> you are joking. You model the victim and you model the killer. Oh, but you are surely mistaken. Am I surely mistaken? I model the victim, yes, from the newspaper pictures. And from the imagination also. But uh, the killer, <laughs> him I did not model. You didn't, huh? Oh, just a head with no face. A head I cover up with a hood because I cannot know the face. Who telephoned you in advance of my coming, Stella? Prime you on how to answer me. Telephone me, but I swear. Was it I... Dolly Flanders, maybe? Dolly Flanders, the owner of the museum? Dolly Flanders, the ex owner of the museum. Oh, no, she did not telephone to me. Now, if this interview is over. I'm to scram and take Mona. Uh, my apologies for it, but I have so much work. You're a shrewd customer, Scala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Craig, for the great compliment. <laughs> there are no, uh, how you say, flies on you either. <laughs> oh, excuse me. He told all he's going to, Mona, so let's go. Isn't there some way of compelling the truth? Yeah, a way that's a beaut. But I don't think you could stand watching it. Oh, Mr. Craig. What? This is a telephone call. It is for you. Nice job of acting mystified, Scholar, over a prearranged deal. Give me the phone. Hello? Craig? You know it's Craig. Guess who this is? The guy I've got a date with, that's for sure. If you live. I won't just shoot a flashlight out of your hand the next time. Through talking? About. I'm on your tail, Craig, every minute. I followed you to Dolly's and I followed you to Scholar's. You better stop chasing around asking people questions, Craig. You better stop. Or else. The case began to wrap itself up with a valuable assist credited to the good Lieutenant Trav Rogers. The return message for me, left with Jake, the elevator ops in my office building, suggested that I meet Trav post haste in the Marble Lawn Cemetery. But why meet in the cemetery? A favorite long lost aunt. Rogers wants me to help dig her up. Oh, Tatchy! Hey, Tatchy! <laughs> Greetings, ghoul. What do you hear from the beyond? Read that tombstone in front of you. In memory of Sam Tracy, born 1910, died 1945. His loving wife, Dolly. Dolly? Barry, Dolly! Don't get into the lieutenant's act, beautiful. It's his show. Let him have the fun. But, uh, not here. Somewhere over a hot cup of coffee... <laughs> That headstone read, Sam Tracy died 1945. He also died in 1951. 
The same man died twice. What Rogers is saying, Mona, is that our Vince Larimer was also named Sam Tracy once. Right. We checked Larimer's fingerprints with police files, as per your request. Larimer's prints correspond to the prints we have of a Sam Tracy, a one-time thief and safe cracker. But there is a Sam Tracy now buried in the Marble Lawn Cemetery. <laughs> Mona's yet going to convert from reporter to detective. No, beautiful. Whoever's buried in Marble Lawn is a ringer. Someone's buried as Tracy, as a trick to free the real Sam Tracy... And it's the late Vince Lallman. That was my guess, too, Barry. Great minds run on the same channels. Who said that? What was the original Sam Tracy trying to escape from? A safe robbery in 1945. Tracy made over the cash haul of $100,000, belonging to a stockbroker named Rufus Scott. The police gave up when Tracy, the, the uh, phony Tracy, as it turns out now, died. Died how? In a rooming house fire while hiding out. And the hundred G went up in smoke. So the police thought, I mean. As did the insurance detective in the case. Insurance detective? A certain Sandy Dowell, an eager beaver in his day. Dowell chased Tracy all over North America before the fire burned him out of the case and into retirement. Well, you got something you can contribute, Craig? This. Sam Tracy, alias the late Vince Lorimer, was the husband of Dolly, the ex-owner of the Starbright Park Museum of Murder. I read the tombstone, too, genius. Besides, it's a matter of record that uh, Dolly Tracy posed as the widow in the phony burial of her so-called husband in 1945. I guess Dolly could be the very late Lorimer's widow this morning. By divination? By a silver wedding ring on her finger. An exact replica of the one you found on the corpse. Uh, well, we know a lot and we know nothing. Tracy got away clean with $100,000. Even got out of the country. Why then did he come back, posing as a Vince Larimer? Why take that risk? And get murdered. And who released the Paris? And why? Frankly, Mona, I don't know if that's really significant. Bet on it, it is, Rogers. It's the key to our killer. All right, where would the key fit? Seed like Park, I'd say. Cram? Yes. Suppose I call the move. Can you bear it? If it catches a murderer. Spoken like a good cop. <laughs> Trav swallowing his pride enough to backstop me, I stormed the Museum of Murder. Yes? You. Close that door, Crump, quick. You, uh, seem urgent. Urgent? There's a rifle happy wild man tagging after me. Where's Dolly? Packed up and gone. I've taken possession. Uh-oh. That's my rifle, man. Don't open that door. Where are you going? To your office. To telephone for help. Now, look, Craig, I can't get involved in your affairs. Craig! <laughs> Hello. Hello. Dead. Yes. Now the line went dead. Someone cut your wires, Crump. Craig, you can't stay here. I'm running a business, now the headquarters. He wants to dead? No, but... Oh, it's this. My rifle happy friend finding the range. Craig, get out of here. I'll be murdered. That's not my concern. I insist you go. You want me to walk out? It's a certain death? It's certain death. Anyhow, staying in here, cooped up in here, it's cornered. Craig, I'll be killed, too. The next bullet might get me. You're raving, Crump. When you stay here, the room is a death trap. You look green, Crump. Sick, as if you're suffocating. Suffocating. Yes, I am. The room's closed. Stifling. Close and stifling like a cage? Yes, yes. And you hate cages, don't you, Crump? Uh, I hate That's why you let parrots out of cages. You can't stand seeing anything caged. No, 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 I can't stand... Even the yellow canary, Dolly's yellow canary. The cage is here, but the canary's gone. You emptied that cage too, eh, Crump? Uh, yes, yes. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. Trav and I swapped postmortems and Tony, while Mona took notes. Claustrophobia, the fear of confinement. Crump couldn't stand anything in cages, or being caged or cornered himself, like I made him feel in his office. It even showed in his clothes. Baggy suits, sizes too big. Shirt open at the neck, no necktie. His clothes gave you the hunch on him. That and the bill of sale Dolly showed me. How so? Crump paid $40,000 for the Museum of Murder. $40,000 for a worthless business. Blackmail? It had to be. Dolly knew it was Crump who'd murdered her husband on the dock. She devised a cute way to make Crump pay off. But why would Crump murder... Now, wait, wait. I think I know. Crump is really Rufus Scott, the, the stockbroker Sam Tracy robbed six years ago. Was hired to rob by arrangement. 
My bet is that Crump invited Tracy to come tap his face. I'll buy that, sure. The Scott firm was on the verge of bankruptcy before that robbery. And then, Tracy never got to keep the stolen $100,000. He was just a tool. The patsy. Lucky to escape with his life. That's why he skipped the country. But, uh, Craig. But? Who staged the rooming house fire and the burial of a bogus Sam Tracy? Somebody who wanted to permanently shut off police interest in Sam Tracy and in the 100G. The men say, uh, you were supposed to be Rogers when you stalked me in the Museum of Murder and helped pull Crump apart at the scene. Ah, uh aha. The beneficiary of the $100,000 was the thug who worked over you, eh? A thug who could only be one guy. Trav, your retired insurance stick. Sandy Dow. Sandy Dow. A guy I've got a date with before you have. Oh, now, Craig, don't be vindictive. Don't you be casual, Trav, about my head. Before you put the cuffs on Dowell, I'm handing him his cuffs, and that's for sure. And before you two stalwarts of the law really go at it in earnest, will you tell me if I've got it down correctly? Uh Uh-uh. Some other time, we'll go into a huddle over your note. Mm -hmm. Just one footnote to murder. Dally ordered that wax exhibit from Scala and invited me to come see it. It was her way of forcing Crump to come across by her museum. The end? Almost. All it needs now is the clinch. The clinch, Barry? Yeah, to keep your storyline straight. Page one, boy meets girl. End page, boy gets girl. Hmm. Oh. Uh, Trav. What? The moose, huh? But, uh... All of a sudden, Mona's got that certain primitive look in her educated eye. Oh. Excuse me for being dense. Yeah, scram, Lieutenant. Please do not louse Craig up with the press. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Murder in Wax, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of the naughty necklace about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I'll tell you how I was hired to buy a string of pearls which was almost woven into a noose to hang me with. See you next week, folks. in the role of Mona was Joan Alexander. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now enjoy Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC. Mm-hmm.